We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. We just need the Stick to Wrestling podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 71st edition of Stick to Wrestling. My name is John McAdam. I'm going to let everyone know right now that I'm a little sniffly, so please bear with me. I apologize for that. Um, But hey, give 60 minutes and we will give you a wicked good wrestling podcast. And we also have a wicked good Facebook page. I'd like to bring in my convivial co-host, Sean Good. And to explain all of that to you, if you sign into our Facebook page, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see a match between uh, the teams of Jimmy Snooker and Roddy Piper versus Ric Flair and uh, pre missing link Dewey Robinson, a 1957 wrestling episode from Maple Leaf Gardens. Billy Robertson and Strong Kobayashi from 1970, the original Hollywood Blondes in Japan, Gorilla Monsoon's memorial column for superstar Billy Graham from 30 years ago, a Ric Flair-Bret Hart one-hour Iron Man match that John was at. Yeah. So the best match and, that I've ever seen live. So it's an old-school wrestling Mardi Gras, except we really don't have any beats. So, Yet. but I mean, that's, that is – we're working on it, though. That is the kind of uh, the stuff. I'll tell you another thing is a uh, story we've been discussing right before the show started, which was um, uh, between uh, uh, involving Raven's uh, work in Memphis and uh, John's uh, how I guess he had an incident with Missy and how John got involved with that. Oh, it wasn't really an incident. Um, They did an angle on the show on the Memphis TV show where. uh, Scott Levy, Scotty the Body, would win a date with Missy Hyatt if he got on TV and beat Jerry Lawler. And you can probably guess how that that went. But the episode was was way the, the whole thing was funnier than I'm making it sound. It's even better than that. You can check it out on our Facebook page. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I ran into Scott, Scotty the Body. It was uh, Memorial Day weekend, 1990. So about a couple of years after this. And I brought that up, and I just said to him, you know, hey, do you need a copy of any of your Memphis stuff? And he just looked at me and said, if you have any of that, burn it. So there we have it. Now, I I brought in – I mean we're dropping this show on October 18th, uh, right around midnight, and I always look up like does anyone have a birthday coming up? John Nord, Nord the Barbarian, has a birthday, and he's perfect for this because I have three little tidbits about John Nord the Barbarian. Number one, Mid-South Wrestling in 1985 came out with this uh, video where they're showing like potatoes and you know basically wrestlers killing each other, like Bobby Fulton get, getting hit in the head with a chair by Bobby Eaton. It made it sound like a shotgun went off. And John Nord, the, on part of this thing, they had Butch come out with the with one side of his face pretty much swollen, completely swollen, his eye was swollen shut. That was due to the handiwork of John Nord in a dressing room brawl. And if you can do something like that to Butch Reed, who was a bad dude, like I ain't going to mess with you. Second one, he was offered the role as Vladimir Pietrov when Nikita Koloff turned babyface. And, I mean, talk about a bad career decision. He turned it down. He turned it down because he didn't want to shave his head. And, I mean, talk about A, Russian stereotypes, and B, men being very vain about their hair in the 80s. Um, you know, the guy who got it, his name was Al Blake. He was he was not as physically imposing as John Nord. He wasn't the athlete that John Nord was. I think Nord really threw something away there. And number three, right after that happened, he got a big push in world class, and he got the main event at Texas Stadium against Kevin Von Erich. Now, I understand world class, like... Take a took a major fall between the '86 Texas Stadium show and the '87 one, but Nord is in a seat. I mean, Ric Flair headlined Texas Stadium twice. Dory Funk Jr. did it. Fritz von Erich did it. Bruiser Brody, Kerry von Erich, Harley Race, and he's in the in, in the category with these guys, at least when th- where this is concerned. But the funny thing was. Kevin was the only Von Erich on the show. Fritz was long gone. Mike, unfortunately, had just passed. Kerry had was still out from the injuries in his motorcycle accident. Lance had already quit. 
And this was explained to Nord. He's like, okay, you know, Kevin needs to go over here. He's the only Von Eric wrestling. And Nord's like, nope, I'm not doing it. So there are my three Nord the Barbarian stories. He turns 59, which seems really young today. And hey, happy birthday, John Nord. Uh, sure, happy birthday. By the way, I, I was amused by your discussion of uh, your, your uh, meanderings about um, Nord uh, in his world class days because we did an episode about this very era. Yeah, and I don't. I don't recall you being as complimentary <laughs> about Nord's work at that time. Well, I mean, he wasn't a great worker. I mean, he, he the guy, you know, thought he was Bruiser Brody coming out of the gate. Um, I mean, he was he was okay, but I, you know, here's me. Bill James, the baseball guy, used to talk about, could I do this career over? And Nord is a guy who totally should want to do his career over. He should have been a way bigger star than he was. I mean, because uh, honestly, when you say John Nord, I'm basically thinking back in the late 80s, there was some tag team with two guys, and he was one of them. <laughs> and they were both like the same thing. It was like yeah. the same gimmick, and they were together. And I, I can't remember which one he was. It was like the Barbarian or the Berserker or something like that. Uh, it was in the AWA. Both guys had face paint, and I am oh, – th- was it him and the Mongolian Stomper? Oh, no. No, it couldn't have been Mongolian. <laughs> Gouldy would have been a million by that point. Uh, that wasn't going to stop Vern. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's that's what that that's what that roster needs. Another old guy. And with that, I want to bring on. I want to welcome a new guest to the Six Wrestling Podcast. He's a good friend of mine. He knows his wrestling, Mister Steve Crawford. Steve, how are you today? Hey, I'm great. I'm looking forward to a wicked good podcast. No, totally. So, tell us a little bit about yourself, like being a wrestling fan. Well, you know, I grew up in uh, northeast Arkansas, so I kind of grew up on Memphis wrestling. Uh, that was kind of like the bread and butter. And then uh, got cable in the early 80s. So got Georgia wrestling, Southwest Championship wrestling. Uh, got the ICW for a couple of years when they were trying to promote against Memphis. Nice. So, so, yeah. So, uh, you know, from about 1981 on, if there was wrestling on the television, I was going to be in front of it. So I uh, just always loved the uh, territory wrestling. Uh, you, you sound like me about five years. Like a, you sound like me just five years later. <laughs> there you go. Okay, and we are continuing the October of Inquiry. I'm sure I call it something different every time, but we are doing a mailbag show. We are continuing with our questions that were unanswered next week. And check out our Facebook group coming up this week to re, to uh, to ask your questions for our final installment. Let's get it started. Jamie Waldrop has an interesting question. 1984. Rick Flair goes to the WWF. Roddy Piper stays in the Mid-Atlantic Territory. How does this change history, in your opinion, Steve? Well, I mean, that, that that's such a huge game changer to even to even think about. You know, first, you know, it's it's really hard to envision Ric Flair going to the WWF in, in that time frame because he was so kind of wedded to the NWA belt. And I don't even know if more money and more exposure and, and the bigger stage at that time would have meant much to him. But, yeah. when, but when you look at, you know, who would have been the NWA champion if Flair leaves and can Crockett expand without having a Ric Flair at the top of every card? Uh, I, I mean, I think that if, if that were to happen and if Flair would have stayed there from 84 on, I, I think you would have seen the territories crash much sooner because I think Vance could have gone into the Carolinas and, and just decimated Crockett pretty early in the game. I mean, I'm looking – I my problem with it is I, – I have a question for John at the end of my comment, but uh, my – the problem is you have two alpha dogs. Uh, I mean, a Piper was kind of alpha too, but he wasn't that high. It was a little bit of difference between him. And you couldn't even get Piper to do a job. What's it going to be like to have Flair? I mean, Flair did them all the time in Mid-Atlantic, so that probably wasn't a big deal. But I think the biggest – and here's my my question to John. I think the biggest concern is, is Hogan big enough to have veto power? Because if he is, he's vetoing this. I think it, before – because he's not over – like I, I think he's worried that uh, Flair walks in and maybe takes some of his stuff, his heat. Oh, um, I don't think to answer both questions. I don't think Hulk Hogan had veto power per se, but I think 
Vince took everything. He took Hogan strongly into consideration uh, with all of his decisions. You know, Hogan, I'm not going to say he was a partner, but he's he had probably more pull than like every other wrestler combined. Um, I, I don't think Hogan would have shied away from Flair. Um coming in, I, I think Flair coming in would have been ultimately stronger than Piper coming in, especially as Steve mentioned, as a draw in the other territories. Um, number one. But number two, you know, they I think if I'm Vince McMahon and I want to bring in Ric Flair, which by the way they did and Hogan never had a problem with it, um, you know, obviously in ninety one, I would have just assured Hogan that look, you know, you're our guy, you're our guy that we're building around, and if Flair O Mania starts to pick up uh momentum, we're gonna we're gonna, you know, kinda kill his push a little bit. But I mean, I agree with Steve. It, it it would have been really hard for all of the territories to see Ric Flair and NWA champion head to the WWF. Um, I think long term, meaning probably sometime in 1984, if Piper had remained in Mid Atlantic and Dusty came in, uh, they would have had to turn Piper again, which could have worked. Um, I think. I think. The Carolinas would have been hurt, but they would have been hurt less than the other territories. I mean, that would have been a a real blow had they known it was coming. Obviously, they would not have put the belt on Flair at Starcade. But, I mean, it's a really good question because it it would have changed history. But at at the same time, I think Piper, not Piper, Flair, I mean, Jim Crockett Jr. was in his wedding. Uh, you know, so, I mean, obviously they're very tight. I think Rick enjoyed the lifestyle of the NWA champion. I think he enjoyed being in mid Atlantic. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it took so long for him to go to the WWF, but great question, Jamie. Moving on question number two, Dean Coles, if Rotundo and not Wyndham is the one who walks out in 85, who do you get to play the Dan Spivey role of look alike? We pretend to, <laughs> he's been here the whole time time mike rotunda steve what are your thoughts you know i i don't know that you can actually plug in somebody that really looked like mike rotunda and worked like mike rotunda during that era um you know you've got wyndham of course who's a top tier worker and and you want somebody that can really go at that level and my thought you know rick martell was the awa champion at that time he would later be in the can-am commit connection i think you just start that sooner if you can and get rick martell into to team with Wyndham, and and then you've got a team that can work with anybody i mean a barry yeah. Wyndham and rick martell tag team would be superb i, I mean sean what are your thoughts renee goulet with <laughs> the glove honestly because anything else is just going to be i'm so sick of them being insulting about this Okay, I mean, if you're going to do it, do like the, the Gilbert thing and just make it so ridiculous that, you know, you can laugh about it. The only reason I wouldn't do that is because Barry's too hot at that point and you'd kill him, even worse than they did. So that's the one reason I, I wouldn't do it. But, I mean, I don't, I don't see who – like I, I don't see anyone you could put in there that doesn't come off as offensive. I mean, can you think of one person? I, you know what? I actually put a, a reasonable amount of thought into this, and I, I couldn't come up with anyone that was so, you know, resembling e- e physically and facially to Mike Rotundo that it would have worked. And here's the thing if, let's say, Mike Rotundo walks out of the WWF, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think even when they first started doing it, I thought that using Barry Windham in a tag team with Mike Rotundo was a little bit of an underutilization of Barry Windham. Like, as soon, by the, for those who don't know, Barry Windham showed up about two weeks before Mike Rotundo, and I immediately said, "Okay, here's a guy who could have a run with the Intercontinental Title." And then Rotundo showed up, and they went straight into the tag team, and we all know what happens next. But I saw Windham as an, both an elite and an upcoming talent in the fall of 1984 and i mean in a way i think the wwf would have gotten a break it's like okay you know now we can push barry as a single um now here's here's a question that i wanted to cover and we've talked about this before the show brian crawley says Vern comes to you in 1988 and asks 
if you can save the AWA. Could you have reasonably done this with the talent available at the time that wasn't signed to a WWF or an NWA contract? What is your game plan? Brian, I like this question so much that I'm not going to answer it today. I, if we're going to put an entire, possibly an entire show, but more likely a segment on this sometime in November, because my my answer alone is probably at least 20, 25 minutes. So I am going to give this all the consideration it deserves, and we're going to give you a full and detailed answer sometime in November. On to Steve Zai. How do you think Ron Simmons would have fit into the Varsity Club stable? Steve, what do you think? You know, I, I think it's a really interesting idea. And I think if they would have pushed Ron as kind of the centerpiece of that, uh, like you had, you know, Rick, you've got Rick Flair and the Horseman, he's the centerpiece, or the Rock later in the Nation of Domination. I think if you have this group, but you say this is really the guy in this group to prepare him for a world title later, I think, I think that's a great launching point for him. So I think it's a really interesting idea. I was halfway listening into hearing you say that question in the entire time. I'm thinking, what the hell is he doing? Um, I thought we were an I thought we were talking about that. Um, so uh, I would say I, it's perfect. I have nothing to add to it. He's pro- I, I'm, I'm mad I didn't think of it myself. Ron Simmons is perfect. I mean, it was something that was being talked about. I don't know if it was something being talked about internally in the NWA, like, you know, hey, should we do this? I mean, it was so organic. How could they not? And I I think he would have fit in perfectly. And I'll go a step beyond that. When Ron Simmons first started in 85, I mean, he he was a guy with a lot of potential. You know, I mean, in case you're not aware, he was a, a nose tackle at Florida State that finished sixth in the Heisman voting that's me mocking jim ross who brought it up three or four times a weekend um but here's guy's a great athlete uh he was legit uh, i mean if you're gonna play nose tackle at florida state you're a tough dude man and it, it and here's the thing everyone always saw potential in ron simmons but he didn't quite he he always felt like uh, I don't know, a square peg in a round hole. And I've always felt like in order for a baby face, especially during this time, late 80s, to get over strong as a baby face, he's got to be a heel first. And to me, this is how you build up Ron Simmons by putting him in the varsity club. I'm not sure, you know, are we talking 88 varsity club or 89 varsity club? Either one would have worked. And that's how you build him up eventually to be a franchise type player, which we all kind of thought he could be and never really turned into, but he had an excellent career regardless. Um, question number five is from Josh Walton. Would Tully Blanchard have worked as the Black Scorpion? Uh, Steve, please give us your thoughts. Woo, I tell you, the Black Scorpion, what what a cluster that whole you know deal was. I mean, what a, what a you know horrible payoff to that angle. I, I just can't see Tully, you know, being what you really want. You know, to finish that angle in a way, to me, the the way that angle works is you bring in a a superstar from from someplace else. You know, he's put over, he screws Sting, Sting loses the title, and then you have Sting chasing the title. And and I don't know that, you know, I, I, I I wouldn't have seen Tully in that role personally, but the whole thing was such a mess that, you know, I don't know how you, you know, could have gotten out of it once they got so far into it. I spent 15 minutes looking at this question, figuring out how I would say no, and I still can't figure out a way. Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely works. If if they pull the mask off and Tully Blanche is under it, this is the beauty. Uh, this is why I think Tully would work because that crowd is very loyal to their guys. It was like the conversation we had a while ago about you know if for some reason Harley didn't make it to Star K83, who do you put in? And they were saying Dusty. Uh, no, it would have had to be someone like Slater or Orton. Because those were the guys who were over for that crowd. That crowd would have gone nuts if Tully was under that. That would have made that entire crap angle worthwhile if that was Tully Blanchard under the mask coming back. Okay, here are my thoughts. And that is that, wow, it's it's been almost 30 years, been 29 years since they started the Black Scorpion angle. And I, to this day, I will defend the first, I don't know, 20, 25% of that angle. When they had the Clash of the Champions, I mean, the 
you know, to start this Sting versus the Black Scorpion, it did a really good rating because of the mystery angle. Um, it was all anyone was talking about. WCW finally got the spotlight. Anytime, you know, someone would call me, this is pre-internet, obviously, or, you know, I, if I had a, a friend who was a casual wrestling fan, they'd be like, who's the Black Scorpion? And depending on who the person was, I would say either I don't know, and I honestly didn't know, or I don't know and and I don't think they know yet unless something has been hidden from me. But at first, it, w- it was really good. It was hot. To answer Josh's question, yeah, it would have worked. It would have worked probably better than than anyone um, because after all the, all the, all this time, Tully is finally coming in. Um, but backing up a little bit, there's there was an issue. Um, Jim Hurd – here, ugh, Jim Hurd, yuck. He he had agreed to bring in Arn and Tully at a certain number, and then Tully flunked a drug test. And Jim Hurd, instead of saying, "Well, Tully, we can't bring you in because you failed a WWF drug test, and that's suspicious anyway," he says, "Tully, you're not worth as much now that you have failed that drug test. Now that you've been fired, so we're, we'd like to bring you in at a lower number." Oh, and Arn, that goes for you too. Well. Both, Tully init- both of them initially said no. Arn Anderson agreed to come in at the lower number. They continued to negotiate with Tully. I mean, it was basically almost, you know, not even a, a week to week. It was almost a day to day drama with those two. And Tully wanted his original number. Uh, Jim Hurd would say, oh, no, I can't bring you in for more money than Arn Anderson and Tully would say, well, just give Arn Anderson his money. And Jim Hurd wouldn't do it. And it, they, they were, the difference I believe was like $25,000 a year per guy, which is a trip to the vending machine for, you know, Turner, Turner enterprises. And they still wouldn't do it. And I think that would have been the, uh, the thing that blocked Tully from coming in is these two couldn't just settle on a contract that worked for everybody. But to answer the question directly, yeah, he would have worked better than anyone else. There would have been some plot holes like, you know, Sting, do you remember Tulsa? Well, Tully and Sting had nothing to do with each other in Tulsa. But yeah, Tully would have been the best guy uh, had it had it been feasible. Um, the best guy, had it not been, would have been Paul Orndorff. Uh, the whole whole Ric Flair under the mask thing was an absolute disaster. I mean, everyone in the arena could see the blonde hair underneath the mask. And it was just, it was such a, it was so bad. And that's why people remember the black scorpion as, as badly as they do, because it ended so badly, but it really didn't start that bad. Anyway, my friend, Jesus Salas Rodriguez asks, which death of a wrestler do you think shook the industry most? Uh, Steve, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think looking at it retrospectively, I, I would say David Von Erich. I think, you know, at the time it happened, you, you thought it was an isolated incident. But then 10 years later, it seemed to be like the start of these dominoes that, that just impacted the entire family. And, you know, if he hadn't have died, what, what would the promotion have done? What would his brothers have done? So, I mean, to me, you, you know, it's it's – Impossible to tell, but but it just seems like that's the start of the tragedy that just ran through that entire family. Uh, I I agree with that, Sean. What are your thoughts? Uh, it's from back then. It's it's difficult to say one guy who would affect the industry because everything was isolated. If you were in Florida, it would be Bobby Shane. If you were in Amarillo, it'd be Iron Mike DiBiase. If you're in, you know, if you're in Dallas, it's, you know, but this also had something to do with another question we had because it was almost hard. But this is the same answer, which was what was the best day for news back in the old days, back in the territory days? Again, it depends on the territory. Um, But here's one that we were discussing online uh, on the Facebook page was uh, that doesn't get mentioned much was Kenny Mack. And he didn't die, but he got shot. And he was like he was a very very big draw, and he was only a couple of years into his career. It would have been interesting. He could have been a star for quite a few years. You know what, Sean? You brought up someone that I literally either don't remember or have never heard of, oh. and I need to look this guy up. Hold um, on, fair enough. Let me uh, let me give you a quick background on Kenny. Kenny was one half of the tag 
team with Don Colts called the Chain Gang in the late 60s. And the team broke up because they were dressed up as uh, bikers. Uh, an actual Hell's Angel gang got mad. And okay. so, so they, they drew a gun and they Don got away, but Kenny got hit. All right. I know his story. I just did not remember yeah. the name. Sean, you brought up an excellent point that like, um, well, first of all, let me say this. You know, Steve brought up that like, David Von Erich seemed to be the beginning of a little bit of an epidemic. And uh, Dave Meltzer in The Observer, I remember him writing uh, when Gino Hernandez died. Dave was like, we are exactly one death away from this industry having a, a – just going through a major uh, media crisis as far as you know, the next one's going to get covered and pro wrestling is going, going to get exposed and there are going to be problems. Um but as far as the and, – and you're right. you know It went from territory to territory. David Von Erich, it impacted Texas, but did it really impact nationally? I can't say yes. Gina Hernandez, same thing. The one, the, the one I say is in second place is Chris Benoit because Chris Benoit, after he died, we had a bunch of people uh, you know, who have a large internet or television audience – Asking, hey, should we be watching this? I mean, if if Chris Benoit, if this industry has turned him into someone who could murder his wife and his young son and then take his own life, you know, should this industry even exist? And that was a, a little bit of a scary time. But the number one uh, death that impacted the industry was Eddie Guerrero because the WWF, that was the day the line was crossed. They said that, look, you know, we're not letting this go on anymore. We are making you take drug tests. We are creating a wellness program. And this time, you know, it's not going to be a wink, wink thing. We're going to take it very seriously. And, and to their credit, they have, although the, the wrestlers don't have a union and the WWF just, you know, makes them take whatever test they want. And they're no longer in control of their lives. They kind of have to hand themselves over to WWE, which I'm not crazy about. I, I don't believe in drug testing. I, I don't believe believe in a prove your innocence program but at the same time i do get that the wwe had a problem um anyway moving to number six, our next question gareth cross asks who never came to memphis you would like to see have a long run building to lawler and who would have worked best in that setting steve what are your thoughts yeah i think you know we, we i think this question was kind of talked about in an earlier episode of stick to wrestling and i may have actually asked the question at that time but uh i thought about it differently when he when he mentioned a long run and a build up to lawler and i think um you know jake the snake roberts uh 83 ish you know when he was when he was still young the ddt was still like the hottest move in wrestling i think you could have really slowly built you know kind of like they did with Kamala where Kamala goes through every baby face in the territory week after week, you know, until they get the big sell out again with Lawler. I think, I think Roberts could hit the DDT on somebody every week and you could have really done a slow build. And of course, you know, the interviews would have just been off the charts. So I, I think that would have been a really good selection. I got a couple, one that I just thought of uh, Bill Eady as the mass superstar. I think that kind of really slow, intimidating, especially with the size, that kind of intim- that, like, quiet interview style of his would get over very big with the mask. Another one is, and he was more in Knoxville, but I think I don't recall him being in Memphis too much, except when he was with his brother. I'm talking about the one-man gang version, which is Ronnie Garvin. I think Ronnie in that kind of just psycho tough guy that he was with uh, for Ron Fuller would have worked very well in uh, Memphis as well. Well, okay, yeah, we we did get asked a similar question not too long ago, and my answer was 1984 Arn Anderson. I'm coming from it from a different perspective here. Someone who never came to Memphis, and you have a a long building run. I guess it depends on what era we're talking about, but let's say we're talking about, I don't know, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83. What if Bob Backlund went to Memphis and defended the WWF title against Jerry Lawler in a babyface who's not really a babyface role. You know, we're, we're, it's supposed to be a babyface versus babyface match, but Lawler 
is clearly the home team. And Bob Backlund, I mean, I think without even trying, he could have been a major heel in Memphis with his entire persona. I mean, think about it. Lawler was one type of baby face and Bob Backlund was another type of baby face. And, and frankly, I think the fans would have turned on Backlund for just you know being who he was, kind of a nerdy guy. Any thoughts on that, Sean? Yeah, I, I would love to see Bob as a heel, as like doing his uh, like the early 90s uh, kind of act. I think that would get over real big. I think Bob gets over either way, but I think more so if he did the heel. I think Bob is that kind of crazy heel would just would print money there. All right. I agree with you in both both cases. But I, I think just Bob being himself is uh, his WWF champion in the early 80s. Like, I think he would have gotten over mm-hmm. huge the heel in Memphis. You think? Oh, as a heel, yeah. I just, as a face, no. No, I mean, that's the thing. He would have been a baby face. He would have been playing the roles of a baby face, and the, the fans would have just rejected it. I think it would have been great. Yeah. Steve, do you, do you want to okay. share any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when Lawler went to Georgia in 1975, I think Backlund was in the territory at the same time. So, so they may have had a little bit of history together. I'm not sure if they ever worked against each other at that time, but uh, but they, they, they would have been known entities to each other. So it wouldn't have been just two guys that didn't know each other at all going into the ring. I am pretty sure someone unearthed a result where Bob Backlund wrestled Jerry Lawler in Georgia in 1975. And thank you for bringing that up. Okay, G. Michael Curto asks, what if Paul Heyman, who had been able to put the financing together and bought WCW instead of Vince McMahon? I can't believe this was almost this was 18 years ago. Steve, what are your thoughts? Right, you know, you know, talk about a question that you like need a whole segment or a whole episode to answer. I mean, that, that's that's such a complicated question because you, you have all these different factors. You know, okay, he has the financing. Did he buy all the contracts? Does he have all the talent? You know, that was still in the in the organization. Does he have television? Um, you know, is he going to book it? So, you know, it, it's there, there's so many complicating factors to this. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, when I, when I look at like ECW in its original, you know, the first few years, it was a really hot promotion. But by the time they got on TNN, that product had gone downhill significantly. So it's not like he was infallible. I mean, you know, he 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 had his strengths and weaknesses like everybody else does. So it would have just been, okay, who's he going to have? What talent is he going to have to work with? What network is he going to be on? You know, who who is he going to push? I mean, there's just so many questions of this. It's just it's just really hard to flesh out that scenario. My first two thoughts I have under this question are one, who's going to give Paul a loan at this point? (laughs) Two, was Charles Keating out of jail yet? Um, okay. First thing is, I don't know where Paul's getting the money. Second thing, a point again, Vince did not buy WCW. Vince bought WCW's library. Okay. Vince wanted nothing to do with the whole operation because that was a massive amount of debt, which you have to get yourself out of before you could even think of doing anything else. And you have all those guaranteed contracts. Nobody wanted the whole operation. And I'm not, like I said, I don't know where Paul's getting the money. Plus, the brand's toast. They have been putting on garbage product for years at this point. So even that's that, they're better off just starting from, you know, from brand new, which is probably why Jarrett did that. Oh, I, I mean, it, I, Sean, I'm, I'm, that's not kind of not what happened. I mean, Vince McMahon wanted to buy WCW. Um, did he? He did. And he huh. wanted he wanted to he wanted everything to remain more or less the same with the two shows um, the uh, Nitro on TNT and uh, whatever they had. What was the name of the secondary show? Thunder. He wanted Thunder. To, to just keep going with that and have kind of a worked wrestling war. And Vince was in negotiation. Jarrett was in negotiation. Bischoff was in the picture as well. Bischoff was was very much in the picture. And then everything changed when a guy named Jamie Kellner canceled Nitro and Thunder from the Turner Networks. And that's that's when 
you know, basically Jarrett and Bischoff dropped out of the picture. This thing's no good without television. Um, Vince bought the intellectual property, uh, WCW, and he tried to get it going again, um, but he couldn't. And this was I, this I didn't understand. No one wanted WCW in terms of national cable. I, I, and this is, you know, May or March of 2001. R- pro wrestling is still hot. And now you have the WWF behind a product that was red hot only two years ago, and no one would touch it. And this included USA Network, who, you know, they were like, hey, we don't want to be known as the wrestling channel, Vince. Sorry. Yeah, that, was, should tell, that should tell you what, what they think of the, uh, the brand at this point. The fact that no one would touch it. Uh, well, it, it was just that no one wanted wrestling. The, the thought was that, you know, wrestling kind of cheapened the network. That's why it got kicked off uh, the Turner stations, because it wasn't, you know, what they were doing at the time. Having a wrestling show on didn't mix in. Obviously, they have one on again now, 18 years later, but it's a completely different world. Um, yeah, Vince, you know, he tried. At one point, there was talk where Raw was going to be a WCW show, believe it or not, and Smack down was going to be wwf because they couldn't they would have done wcw smackdown but their contract prohibited it if i recall correctly and yeah they they tried really hard but at the end of the day they paid four million dollars which was nothing just for the intellectual properties of wcw but it, oh back to what if paul Heyman? let's say i don't know a million dollars fell out of the sky and paul Heyman had it and he decided to run wcw um, and he was able to buy it, and he was able to keep it on the networks. Um, and I need to point this out too. You know, the uh, Turner they paid for the contracts. Vince did not pay for the contract. So if Paul can get some money together, I you know it's hard to say. I think Paul was very burned out by this point. He had gone on his seven or eight year run with ECW, and I think he was starting to show the strain. But if he had gotten it and if he had listened to the right people and if he had – I think if, if Paul had, had hired other people to run the business and if Paul Heyman had run the wrestling end of it, it would have had a chance. I mean when WCW closed, it was still salvageable that by by – Comparing their ratings to other cable shows, the ratings were still pretty good. It's just that you compared to the WWF and compared to what they were doing two years ago, the the ratings stunk. But anyway, and like I said, the guy, Jamie Kilner, he just wanted to get rid of that kind of programming. On to Vincent Rocasano. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, sir. Why? Did WWE use a fake Tonga kid for a segment of Piper's Pit? Steve, before I get your answer, I am not familiar with this at all. Have you ever heard about this? Uh, well, I actually I, I looked it up because I, I saw the question was going to be asked today, and it was actually you know Samu who was later you know uh, with the with the uh, Fatu and. The uh, some of SWAT team and, and, and those different, you know, they had a very long career together, the head shrinkers. Uh, as to why he was on Piper's Pit, I have no idea. There was some speculation that that maybe it was just done to, to put into a VHS tape during that era that wasn't actually a live segment, but I have no idea why it was done. Viz probably thought we're all dumb enough to not notice, uh, which goes, you know, <laughs> but honestly, my note is this John McAdam to the white courtesy phone. I have never heard of this before. I, I don't even remember it, but I mean, wh- why would you do that? I, I couldn't even imagine. I think maybe it was, uh, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot, like WWF in like 84, 85, 86, it was not a, a well-oiled machine at all. They were kind of all over the place with stuff. And I'm not even joking. This could have been like Roddy Piper thinks he was talking to the Tonga kid and wasn't, or, and it just got by everybody. Who knows? I mean, both guys were in the company as early as, uh, I want to say spring, summer, 1983, Tonga Kid was basically a step above a jobber, and Samu was the substitute Samoan. He was the third Samoan when one of them got hurt. So maybe it was just one of those mistakes that made it onto the air. But oh, I <laughs> hope I can, didn't bangle your question too bad, Vincent. 
You, you can check it out. It's it's out in the universe. Uh, it, it's out, is it out there on like YouTube? Yeah, it is. All it right, is. I will put that on the STW page, and we will have further discussion. John Moore asks, we just had the 20th anniversary of the infamous Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view. What did you think about that show then, and what do you think of it now? Steve, have you seen that show? I did not see it. Uh, I remember reading the Wrestling Observer at the time, you know, after the pay-per-view, and just what a train wreck the entire event was. And my, my reaction was money mark. You know, the boys yep. found a money mark and they were going to have a payday and they were going to have a good time and they didn't care because they knew it was a one shot deal. And, 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 you know, they had a party on somebody else's dime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much true. Sean, your comments. Yep. That's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, I, I, the only problem with it is, is that it was, I mean, you cannot look at even leading up to it. You're looking at that like this is going to be terrible. Uh, so it wasn't like there was big expectations here. And it was it was the hopes was it would be bad, but comically bad, like something you can kind of look at. You know, oh, that was like, you know, the Russell Rock Rumble or something like that. You could talk about 20 years later about bad. But when Jake got involved, it went from bad to uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's where you kind of lost it. And that's why it doesn't you know, it doesn't have that more fun Russell Rock Rumble kind of rep. And it's more tragic because of Jake. But I mean, the, I, I honestly think they were hoping it would be kind of you know just quirky bad you cannot like even leading up to it you knew this was going to be terrible yeah i didn't order it i got a copy of the tape from somebody um i mean coming into it i i knew about it believe it or not i think there was a way this could have been done where it was pretty decent like you know almost like a wwe hall of fame ceremony like okay we're we're honoring the legends of the sport and obviously that's not what it turned into i will not lie to you guys i Watched the tape once back in 1999. There was a great deal of fast forwarding being done, and I have not seen it since. But I mean, in, in a way, you know, when you saw what happened with Jake Roberts, you know, yes, I was at this laughing at him at the same time, feeling sorry for him. You know, I know that's got to be very difficult to overcome those kind of things. But I mean, especially you can't keep yourself straight, you know, just for that. However many hours you need to be OK and then hit the bottle after the show, you know. But I mean, the whole thing was was a disaster. And I think Steve you know, put it to, together succinctly that, you know, it was just a party on someone else's dime. Um, and he, and again, I was saying this at the time, there were two categories of wrestlers. There were the Greg Valentines and the George Steeles, the guys who, okay, I understand why there's a wrestling war going on. These guys are not involved in it because they're just too old. And there was another category of guys like Jake Roberts and Two Cold Scorpio were like, okay, you, there's a wrestling war going on and there's a huge demand for talent. And guess what? You guys are still on the outside looking in for various reasons. But anyway, I like this question. What if, from Lawrence Miles? What if JCP decided to keep the tag belts on Wyndham and Luger and make Sting world champion after Clash 1? Does anything change for JCP? Steve, you have the floor. Okay, I, you know, when I think about Sting winning the belt in 1988, I just think that would have been really premature. You know, you, he had been in the business about three years at that point, and I think people would have looked at him like Ronnie Garvin, like, you know, we enjoyed watching this guy chase the belt, but when once you have it, you think, yeah, this doesn't really work. This doesn't belong here. So I don't think in the long term that that was the answer at that time. I think that would have been kind of a hot shotting type of move that I don't think would have worked out too well. I'm not sure. I, I to go off of what Steve just said. I'm not sure they ever did. Sting ever draw as champion? I know he's drawn chasing it. But, I mean, I'm not sure he's ever drawn with the belt itself. Uh, and uh, Wyndham and Luger are just way too valuable as singles to leave them together for too long. I mean, you're, just, you're basically tying up two matches right there or, or one with them by having them as a tag team. They're both star-level singles. Uh, it's just – it's a waste to have them together. All right. You know, I mean uh, – Sean, you brought up, you know, was Sting a draw as champion? No, he wasn't. However, I mean, I think 
I'm not saying what you said was unfair to Sting, but the, the general people saying, oh, Sting didn't draw his champion. I mean, no one was drawing in that company. Ric Flair really wasn't drawing his champion after they put the title back on him after Sting. Um, but anyway, like I said, I think it was more of a company issue than a Sting issue. I'm going to answer Lawrence's questions two different ways. Number one, at the time in March 1988, if someone had even suggested that, hey, let's put this title on Sting at the Clash of the Champions, everyone would have said you were crazy because you had basically the NWA for the past 13, 14 months had been building towards Lex Luger challenging Ric Flair for the title and eventually winning it and then making Lex Luger their version of Hulk Hogan, which they never got around to doing, obviously. Um, so – I mean, everything was leaning into the paper, the 1988 Great American Bash pay-per-view, Luger versus Flair, where I, the original plan, I know, was to put the title on Luger, and obviously that never happened. So th- you couldn't have done it then. However, I, you know, another thing, Sting wasn't really established as, as a top heel star. It was that match that got him established. But you know what? In retrospect – I think they should have tried it. I really do because the company was in such bad shape. Ric Flair was getting uh, stale as the world's heavyweight champion. I mean, nothing could have been worse for JCP that, that, you know, other than what actually happened, you know, seven or eight months later, they're sold to Ted Turner. I mean, what if they had that clash of the champions with a giant rating? They have that four and a half star match, but it ends with Sting as really the new NWA champion. And by the way, they would have had to go into the ring and announce that, hey, this this decision is not being reversed. Sting is the new champion. But the place would have gone crazy. You, The NWA definitely would have gotten everyone's attention, not only with a successful clash, but now you've got a new champ. Even if you take the title off Sting at the Great American Bash, which I'm not even sure they should should have done i i think it in retrospect it would have been a good idea i mean sting was getting hotter and hotter and hey strike while the iron is hot sean you made a good point about luger and Wyndham being too big to hold the tag team titles i agree with you i mean one thing they could have done long term was turn luger back heel and then do luger and sting for the title i don't know but good question from lawrence and you know what we've got one from dylan Barakowitz, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. If the Territory Days had the internet, what would have been the biggest news day of the week? Steve, I'll tell you what, give me your opinion on that. I, I think the you know the big days would have been whenever the tapings were. So if you're in a territory and it's Memphis and you're live on Saturday morning, that would have been the big day for that. Uh, if you're doing you know a taping on a Wednesday night at the Irish McNeil Boys club because the tapings would have told you here's the angles that are going forward here's the new talent coming in here's who's left the territory so i think people would have been tracking the the tv times to see what the future for the companies were going to look like i think that would have been the big day and this goes back to what I was uh, – about the, the question about which death had impacted the area the most. It depends on when – first, I would think for, for say, Memphis, it would be Tuesday because that would be the day after the big uh, Mid-South show on Monday. Or you know, I, I will say this though. The one – like if you want to pick a day in the year, it would probably be the day after Thanksgiving. That Friday, because mo- a, lot, a lot of – if not most of the territories had big shows on, the thanks- on Thanksgiving. All right. I mean – and. You know what? I like this question because, I mean, I was around back in the days pre-internet when, you know, your your internet message board was someone calling you and, and giving you news or, or getting the observer. I'm not really getting the observer because that's in print. The biggest news day, if we had an internet during that day, it would have been Saturday because – It would have been the day that you you saw the wrestling shows and you could actually discuss what went on during them. Um, So I I would say Saturday. I mean, obviously, there would have been, you know, the the Monday after the Madison Square Garden show would have been huge. Uh, I agree with Sean. Mondays after the Mid-South Coliseum would have been big. Uh, Anytime you had a big show in any territory. Um, But in the in like the the observer era, we're talking now like mid to late 80s 
early 90s, I mean, the biggest day for news going around, the WWF always did their superstar ratings, which is the their main TV program, every third Tuesday night. And I was, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I was waiting for my phone to ring, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to hear from someone, not directly from someone who went to the tapings, but someone who got the news that went on in the tapings, because that's when the big stuff happened. And sometimes it would be like, you know, okay, they did this big angle, and it's in a little bit of a vacuum, or I remember the day that I heard that, um, you know, they had built something up, and we were going to see a Dusty Rhodes versus Randy Savage feud, and I just remember my mind being blown that, like, wow, they were giving Dusty that big of a spot, because we originally... We, everyone thought Dusty was going to be a mid-card guy there, and I give Dusty credit. He got over despite being giving a, uh, given a gimmick that was kind of silly. Uh, Lawrence Miles has another question. The original WrestleMania 4 plan was that Ted DiBiase would win the title, and by the way, that is correct. Had that happened, would he have made it to WrestleMania 5 as champion? Uh, Steve, give us your thoughts. Well, you know, I, I love Ted, Ted DiBiase. I've always been a huge fan of his work. I, I wish he'd gotten a run with the NWA title at the time. Uh, but when you look at WrestleMania five, you know, that was Savage versus Hogan. They went through the, the superpowers and then broke up and, and then headline WrestleMania five. I, I think that's a much bigger match. I don't think DiBiase against Hogan or Savage would have been nearly as big a match. Would have to say he he wouldn't have made it to WrestleMania five, but I would I would have loved to to run with the world title. No way, uh, they, it's just not how they booked back then. You never had a long term booking with uh, with the heel champion. I, that's why you know why didn't Billy Graham have the belt longer? That was a freakishly long reign back then for a heel champion. I mean, usually it was a couple weeks or so. It was like a Dusty Rhodes with the NWA title kind of thing. Uh, so to have it that long, it just nobody ever had the belt. That I don't. I'm trying to think of a heel. There was never a heel who had the belt for the Graham would have been the longest. So yeah, this well, would have been Graham right under that by far by that point. Yeah, and this this still wouldn't have been that long. But there's no way, especially with if if Hogan's still around. Um. I, offering my opinion, I agree. I think he would have lost. I don't think there's any way Ted DiBiase would have held the title through the next WrestleMania. I'm not, I think that he would have either lost the title to um, either Hogan. The question would have been, who would he have lost the title to at SummerSlam? Would it would it have been Hogan or Savage? If it was Hogan, it would have gone right back to business as usual. If it had been Savage, you know, they definitely would have had Hogan and Savage at WrestleMania five as, you know, as had, which is what actually happened. Um, but yeah, I agree with John. There's no way they would have got given Ted DiBiase that long a run. Okay. Next question is from Cartwright Jones. And this is a good one. Why? Are certain wrestlers like Roddy Piper, or excuse me, Hulk Hogan, rightfully raked through the coals for not for playing politics, while others like Roddy Piper are not? And you know what? I'm going to add another name to this question. Let's say Roddy Piper and Ric Flair. Steve, share your thoughts with us. Well, I, th I think it's because you know the hardcore wrestlers, the people that eat, sleep, and breathe wrestling, they loved Roddy Piper and they loved Ric Flair. So they gave them all sorts of leeway because that's the type of wrestling they wanted to see. That's the sort of interviews that they responded to and, and the in-ring style they responded to. And, and Hogan had more of a mass audience, but the hardcore fans were never the big Hogan fans. So I think it was just a way to say, well, this guy's really not this great because yeah, he's drawing all this money, but he's he's playing politics, and that's why he gets ahead. So I think it's just the bias of, of what the wrestling fans like to see. Also, keep in mind the actual characters these guys were and how they were portrayed. Uh, for, for Rick and Roddy, that sounds like something they would do. Uh, the problem with Hogan is that he, for years and years and years, had to do the the the, the gold, the yellow and red, and the eat your vitamins and you know you know twenty. 
for 28 inch pythons and all the other crap. And then, you know, finally, you know, oh, he's a steroid guy and all this. Stuff. It's the hypocrisy of it. I mean, that's more, you know, Piper and Flair don't present themselves as some holier than now. Hogan did. That's a, that's a good point. Um, and I'll answer this in a couple of different ways. Number one, I agree with Steve that, you know, if you like someone, you are more uh, likely to kind of turn a blind eye to their faults or maybe perhaps put better be more forgiving of their faults. Whereas if you don't didn't like Hulk Hogan anyway, you're going you're definitely going to hold this against him even more but number two and let me point this out too roddy piper was bad with this stuff as we mentioned before roddy rarely did jobs i mean he lost the united states title in crockett without lose uh, without doing a job i mean that sort of thing you know he wouldn't you know, Vince McMahon is trying to promote nationally. That means he's got to go to Seattle and Portland, and Roddy Piper would not have any of it. Uh, you know, stuff like that. And, and you know, Roddy was pretty bad. But here's the thing with Hogan, and I think this is why he gets raked over the coals more than Flair and Piper. I, I can't remember Ric Flair or Roddy Piper actually trying to undermine someone else. I can remember Hogan doing it. Uh, I know I've heard Hogan went out of his way to make sure that Hacksaw Jim Duggan was not a threat to him when Duggan arrived in 1987. Then we get to Hogan later career in WCW. I mean, Brian Pillman, uh, when he was doing his you know psycho horseman act and people were wondering if it were, was a shoot. I mean, Hogan was actively, he saw that Brian Pillman was hot and tried to put him in this like crazy two on seven cage match in order, in, in order just to cut his throat. And of course, Pillman decides that, you know, he's going to play that game with Hogan. He's, oh, I'm too hurt to be in that match, Hulk. But that was the biggest thing. I think, you know, Flair and Piper were looking out for themselves, certainly. And sometimes in the wrestling business, you have to do that. But Hogan was, was looking to cut other guys off at the knees. Um, Another question, Kevin Barrett. What if Buddy Landell does not, in his own words, F, 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 C, K, all fuck up all his way? Where does his career go? Steve, your thoughts? Yeah, I was a huge Buddy Landell fan. Uh, you know, I, besides, you know, the, the quote demon issues that he had, you know, I think that uh, he, he wasn't a political guy. He didn't know how to play that game. Uh, I, I, as an in-ring talent, I think, you know, he could have been a top star at the NWA, uh, not not at the main event level, maybe semi-main event level for a few years, and, and then they would have shuffled him along. But he, he definitely had a much higher ceiling than, than, uh, than, than he uh, performed. Uh, well, it was – I would first of all, if you take out the Fubar Alchemist out of uh, Buddy Landell, he's not Buddy Landell, so <laughs> that that's one problem. But uh, just as uh, pure talent, he comes in straight. Uh, he's not the same guy. He's going to be different. But I say his upside as far as talent goes is immense. The biggest problem he faced is the gimmick. He's in the same lane with Flair, so no one could take him seriously as a main event guy because you're looking at him. And so basically he's a like poor man's Ric Flair, and anybody would be a poor man's Ric Flair at that point because in 85 and 86 when he was in JCP, Flair was the flipping man. I mean, I first of all, uh, you have to see if you haven't 1984 Mid South Buddy Landell. I mean, it was he was one of the greatest heels ever. It was 86 Memphis. Ah, uh, yeah, that too. Good point. But I mean, he was different in 86 Memphis, though. Uh, similar, but different. I mean, Buddy Landell was the, the he wasn't like a Ted DiBiase, I'll kill you heel. He was the weaselly little guy that hid behind Ernie Ladd and Butch Reed. And it, it worked out great. And finally, when Reed turned, Landell, you know, fit right into that role of, you know, the skittish little heel. He, now, here's the thing. When he came to JV, JCP, you know, yeah, he was Ric Flair Jr. But to me, that was his charm as a heel. This guy, 24 years old, he's a punk, and he's trying to be Ric Flair. I've mentioned this on the show before, I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah. Buddy Landell was going to get a huge push right before he screwed up and missed the TV taping. He didn't miss the TV taping. He's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm sleeping in. I'm not coming. Um, he was going, they were going to do an angle. Buddy was the national heavyweight champion. He had just won it at Starcade 85. And they were going to do an angle where Baby Doll decides, okay, t- this guy's a champion and, and Tully isn't, and he, she was going to be part, she was going to be with Buddy Landell, and that's how they were going to put Tully and JJ together. So he, you know, I think he was, and as, as he got older, I think he would have found his own lane. He wouldn't have been Ric Flair Jr., and I think he could have had an absolutely great career. Um, he didn't at the end of the day, and it's kind of sad. Uh, last question. What if Randy Savage went in 1983, 1984, what if he went to Mid South instead of Memphis? Steve, your thoughts? Yeah, that's a real interesting question. You know, when, when ICW closed, uh, Lanny Poffo actually went to Mid South, and Randy, I think, was scheduled to come in. And, and Watts at that time had a pretty good relationship with Jerry Jarrett, and said, "No, you really need to go to Memphis. That's that's where the money is. Your payday with Lawler." Uh, but if he would have gone to Mid South. You know, I, I think he would have gotten a huge push in that environment. And then you wonder, you know, does he ultimately become an NWA guy instead of a WWF guy? Uh, and, you know, would he have been given that stage that he got in the WWF? Would he have been given that opportunity if he'd not gone to the WWF? Would he be as well remembered today? So I think, you know, it could have really put him on a different path for his entire career because, you know, the, the Memphis – and Jimmy Hart connection kind of got him in the WWF, but Bill Watts may have pushed him more toward another NWA territory when his time ran there. So it could have been a much different career for Randy Savage. They would have killed each other. Watson, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I can't get past the fact that they would have killed each other. I mean, can you imagine that much? I mean, you could blow off the side of a mountain with that much, like whatever they had, uh, you know, testosterone in one room they, they would have absolutely killed each other but yeah i know he would have been crazy over but i i can't get past the fact that this would not have lasted a month without somebody blowing up but randy at this point 1984 is going to be over everywhere i mean he is just that good i mean he's even better than he was in in when you finally see him in the wwf and a couple years earlier he was better than that because his, his knees were a little bit stronger. So he would have been over wherever he went. But there's no way those two personalities work. I mean, Sean, I, I don't know about that. I, I know what Watts was like. But f- from what I've always heard, Randy was a pretty cooperative guy. Um, take away the honky-tonk man angle thing from the uh, 1989 – or was it in from the 1988 NBC special where he threatened to kick honky-tonk man's head off um, yeah how many how many years in the how many years pro uh, before or after was the waffle house incident uh that was 82 i think 81 yeah. maybe oh yeah that would have gone over big in mid-south i uh, but you know yeah. what like go the, ahead the waffle house would have actually been like 77 because that was like nick oh, was earlier. Yeah. okay yeah. all right thank you steve yeah, yeah. um you know, I think here's here's my take on it. Randy Savage had been wrestling for not a lot of money for a long time, and Mid South was a money territory. Um, I think he would have just, you know, like everyone else did, just you know, put up with Watts, taken the paycheck, and gotten on the road. In, in every place that Randy has been up until that point, and even after that, he had succeeded where they were, where the promoter was somebody who would massage stars. Who would you know? Who would sit there and you know cater? Bill didn't do that. Uh, I, uh, I never really heard that about. Oh, then again, you hadn't been Jared. You're right. He'd been working for his dad pretty much his entire Jared career. Jared Vince. All right. I, I, what if he had gone to Mid South instead of Memphis? I mean, it could have been a game changer. I, I'll, let me just say this: the first time I saw Randy Savage on WWF TV in 1985. Uh, I mean, I was wondering, where has this guy been all this time? I, I'd never seen him wrestle before. I'd seen pictures of him, him in magazines, but that's it. And I, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like, you know, where was this guy hiding? Um, had he gone to Watts, I think it, it's an outside chance that Watts would have looked at this guy and said, okay, 
this is the guy I can build around. I think he, he's going to be my next JYD. I think I, he'll be bigger than Duggan, bigger than Reed. And who knows, maybe he could have kept Mid-South alive a little longer than it was. Probably not. But to answer the question, he would have been a way bigger star than he, he would have been you know, in Memphis. Not that he wasn't a big star in Memphis, just Memphis wasn't as big a territory. Um Steve Crawford, thank you so much for taking the time to be on. You're a great guest. I appreciate it. Hey, it was an honor. An honor and a pleasure. All right. And once again, I want to thank Sean Goodwin for everything he does behind the scenes for this show. Uh, and thank you for being my co-host. I also want to thank Lou Kippelman, who is an awesome producer. He do, uh, Once again, he does a lot of things that people don't see. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We'll see you next week. I'm not even going to say go Vols. <laughs>